This short video will be on DNA structure. It's the first half of chapter 7. So DNA is made up of deoxyribonucleotides, and uh, these all have three main components to them. They have a sugar called deoxyribose, which is shown right here. They have a phosphate group, and then they have a base. And all of these uh, de deoxyribonucleotides have the same sugar and phosphate part, but they differ in the base. Okay. A little bit about the deoxyribose sugar. So this is a five-membered ring, and um, oxygen is one of the members of the ring. So there's an oxygen, and then there are four carbons in the ring, and one carbon that is not part of the ring. If you remember from your organic chemistry, we number these carbons starting uh, clockwise from that oxygen. So this one would be the one prime carbon, the two prime, three prime, four prime, and then the five prime carbon. To the five prime carbon is attached this phosphorus. Okay, so the phosphorus is surrounded by four oxygens, which makes it a phosphate. Just remember that phosphorus forms five bonds, so that one of these then has a, dub a double bond. Also, on the three prime carbon, there is an OH. This is extremely um, important for the function of these, uh, these nucleotides. This sugar is called deoxyribose because um, it's very similar to another sugar called ribose, which is used in RNA. But the main difference is that in, R in, in the sugar ribose, uh, you have an OH on the two prime carbon as well. All right, and so this is just removing that OH, so thus it's called deoxy, so removing one oxygen from the ribose structure. The bases are always found on attached to the one prime carbon, okay, and here we have adenine and guanine are called purine nucleotides. Um, these bases are, are double uh, ring uh, nitrogen rings, okay, and then the pyrimidines only have a single ring, a single nitrogen ring. One way that I remember this, and I'll just point this out to you, pyrimidines, that this word has a Y in it, and you'll notice that the uh, bases with Ys in it, cytosine and thymine, are both also pyrimidines. Okay, so uh, before the structure of DNA was really known, um, it was, you know, people were very interested in what the genetic material was, and people generally recognized that there were some really important things. So, first of all, the structure had to allow some mechanism of replication, and so we know that the DNA has to be completely duplicated, and, you know, every cell has to contain that entire genetic uh, material. Second, DNA has to have this informational content. It has to code for proteins, right? It has to carry information. And then it has to have the ability to change um, to account for the fact that we see these uh, mutations that are inherited from one generation to the next. So we'll come back to these three properties um, at the very end in the discussion in class. I want to start off with some historical historic experiments that looked at, uh, that were very key experiments in, in what eventually led to, you know, the, the discovery of the structure of DNA. So first of all, this man named Chargoff um, did a lot of biochemistry. So he took purified DNA, um, broke apart the nucleotides, and measured how, you know, the different amounts compared to each other within one organism. And so he found these rules, and these rules were always true no matter what organism he looked at. So um, he found that the number of pyrimidine nucleotides always was equal to the amount of purine nucleotides, okay? The molar amount of thymine always equaled that of adenine, all right? Molar amount of guanine always equaled that of cytosine, and, but the molar amounts of the A's and the T's did not equal that of combined the G's and the C's. Okay, so this kind of told you how are the amounts of the nucleotides relative to each other. Some other extremely important historic experiments were done by these two people, uh, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. 
And this was x-ray diffraction data. And what this is, is you uh, crystallize a molecule of DNA, and then you hit it with an x-ray, and you uh, can see a certain type of uh, certain dif diffraction pattern, which is shown down here. Um, and people who are experts in this can uh, can interpret this data and figure out information about the structure of, of that uh, molecule. And so uh, these folks, Franklin and Wilkins, uh, figured out a lot, some really important information. First one is that DNA is very long and skinny. It's a long molecule, and it has two similar parts that are parallel to each other. Second part is that it's actually helical. It twists around. Okay, and taking some of this background information, um, these two very famous people, Watson and Crick, um, in 1953, they proposed the structure of DNA. And I just want to point out that theirs was a completely theoretical paper. They published this paper, um, and you know it was based on on the space model, you know, molecular modeling, but. Um, what they published was kind of, as soon as people read it, they, they immediately realized this structure must be it because it, you know, it takes care of all of those important criteria for how DNA must, must function. And certainly, you know, there were experiments that followed that proved that their structure was indeed correct, but um, it was kind of an interesting uh, point in history because you know, these guys just made a completely theoretical suggestion about what that structure was based on you know other people's work and background of what what was known in the field. Um, they went on to win the Nobel Prize for their work, along with Maurice Wilkins. So, uh, what was this structure that they proposed? So, first of all, uh, there are two parallel strands of nucleotides, okay, and this forms a double helix. So you have something like a ladder that forms together, these two individual strands um, form a ladder, and then this ladder just turns around to form a, a helix. So when this double helix forms, there's a couple of important things. So first of all, um, the part that forms the, the um, you know, the, the support, the structure of the ladder are actually alternating sugar and phosphates. And we'll look at the exact uh, molecule, the molecular structure in a minute here. The part that's forming the rungs of the ladder are actually interactions between the bases. And specifically what they uh, figured out is that A's always pair with T's and G's always pair with C's. Okay, now A's and T's um, and G's and C's always form this particular um, arrangement where you have one purine molecule together with one pyrimidine molecule or one purine base with a pyrimidine base. Um, what they figured out, Watson and Crick figured out that it's the two purines would be really too wide to make the structure, whereas two pyrimidines would not end up close enough to each other to actually form bonds between them. Last thing I'll mention on this slide is that when this helix forms, there are uh, two grooves that form within that helix. There's a wider groove called a major groove right here and a minor groove. It's narrower. Okay, so let's now look at the how the molecules actually attach to each other, how these bases attach. So the way that one nucleotide attaches to the next is as follows. Um, the phosphate of one, one nucleotide will attach to the three prime carbon of the, uh, the next nucleotide. Okay, now remember that three prime carbon is the one that has that OH. And so when this bond forms, um, you lose that hydrogen, right? And this uh, bond that forms between those is called a phosphodiester bond. Now, it's important to realize that, um, so every time you make, you add a new base here, that uh, these molecules are polarized, okay? So at one end of this DNA strand, you will have an OH sticking out. At the other end, you'll have a phosphate um, available for the next nucleotide to, to bond with. And what we call these are, we call this the three prime end of the strand of DNA because that OH is attached to the three prime carbon. 
The other end we call the 5' prime end because that phosphate is attached to this, the 5' prime carbon. Now if you look on the other strand, the other strand is, has that same kind of polarity uh, except what Watson and Crick discovered is that it goes in the opposite direction. So whereas this one is 5' prime to 3' prime going from the bottom to the top, this other strand opposite of that is 5' prime to 3' prime from the top to the bottom. So the rungs of this ladder then are formed by hydrogen bonds that form between these bases. And uh, importantly, the, um, the T's and the A's form two hydrogen bonds between them, whereas the C's and the G's actually form three hydrogen bonds between them. Um, thus, because there are three bonds between these, these are more stable bonds than the A and T uh, interactions. Okay, and the last thing I'll just uh, point out is that when we look at DNA structures, what we actually do is focus in on the things, on the informational content. And so we look at the bases and we remember the order, all right? And so we're going to start, uh, so each DNA strand is uh, written uh, usually 5 prime to 3 prime. So we're going to start right here with the 5 prime end and I'm going to say this is the 5 prime and then we have the A, C, T, G. Okay, that's the 3 prime end. And opposite that is the anti-parallel strand going 5 prime to 3 prime in the opposite direction from right to left. Okay, so we have C, A, G, T.